this is James from TDB. Today I'm going to have an in-depth episode uh, covering poor storage. Uh, I'm calling this the poor storage explainer. So the topic of poor storage is really um, it's very controversial and it's filled with a lot of strong opinions. After brewing tea is stored in places like Guangdong or Fujian, it is often quite obvious to me that the tea was stored there due to the unique smell and slightly moldy taste that it has. I also tend to notice a dry or scratchy throat after a drinking session of wet stored raw In wine. Guangzhou, they also have a lot of types of storage. People who care about their poo will have tasty tea. But a lot of poo after two years they get some terrible tea smell on wrapper and taste not Most really pleasant. Most tea sucks. Have you had any tea that has been stored in food mean for over 10 years? It does not age. The whole point of storing poo is that it's supposed to get better with age. If your conditions are too dry, it does not age. And you can <laughs> For people coming to this topic afresh, I think it's important to understand where this comes from. Like many other Heicha, which are dark teas, uh, Pur uh, has primarily been an export. It's a geographically specific tea, and while there are imitations of Pur grown outside of Yunnan, a tea needs to be grown in Yunnan for it to be considered Pur. If you read Zhang Jinghang's uh, book, Ancient Caravans and Urban Chic, she begins the book by talking about her experience with Pur growing up in Kunming, the capital and largest city of Yunnan. Like many people at that time, my parents and I were unconcerned about the difference between Yinnan's Pur tea and green tea. My understanding was that green tea was the loose tea stored in a jar that we served to guests, while Pur tea was compressed, usually into a bowl shape. The latter was more often given as a gift to friends outside Yinnan than consumed at home. I once found some leftover puar tea in a cabinet. Each cake was shaped like a small bowl, half the size of a ping pong ball. Out of curiosity, I took a cake and infused it. The color of the brew was similar to that of Yinnan's green tea, but the compressed small bowl unexpectedly swelled up in the hot water to more than five times its original size. The brew was so strong that I decided I didn't like it. Rather than being familiar with Pur and drinking it often, she compares it with the sort of a weird compressed form of green tea that she didn't try much, and when she did, she didn't like it. Instead of being grown in Yunnan and consumed largely within Yunnan, much of the consumption from the 1950s onward was sent to Hong Kong, Macau, and Southeast Asia. It doesn't take much digging to realize that Hong Kong, despite being around 700 to 800 miles away from Yunnan, has a long and incredibly important relationship with Pur, both in terms of storage and consumption. If you ever find yourself in Hong Kong, you'll be able to find lots and lots of Pur, sometimes referred to as Bole, uh, both in restaurants as well as in tea houses and tea shops. Um, it's especially commonly associated with dim sum, um, a Cantonese food style, but this Pur is rarely the green tea that Zhang Jinghong's book refers to at the beginning. It's dark, smooth, and mellow, uh, and it usually brews red or black. Today, that's most typically identified as ripe. I didn't try Pu'er tea again until 2002, when I joined a film crew that was making a documentary about people involved in tea production in Yinnan. The film director from Beijing continuously drank Pu'er tea that he had brought in from Yinnan. The dry compressed tea and the brew he made were both dark red. I asked for a taste. It was quite smooth, but it had an earthy smell. Another member of the crew, who was also from Yinnan, said it was moldy. Its color, smell, and taste were all new to me. Ripe Pur, though, was invented in, wasn't invented until the 1970s, so before then, they were drinking raw Pur. If you've just been exposed to the Western tea scene, this may be confusing. Smooth, mellow, dark colored raw Pur. As you likely figured out, this is not the sort of raw pur you'd buy freshly pressed from, say, white tea or Yunnan sourcing. So what causes this tea to transform from a sort of green tea into something dark, smooth, and mellow? That brings us to what I usually refer to as traditional storage. 
A lot of the credit, at least in the English language, should definitely go directly to Marshallin, um, who is a fantastic blogger, and his post, Traditional Not Wet. Taken straight from the post, I think this is the best straightforward description of traditional storage that I've seen. The tea goes into ground storage, which is usually some basement in a building on a hill or something similar, so it's quite damp and dark. Usually, the storage unit already has lots of tea in there, aging, and the vendor would make room for the tea. Now, this environment is usually high humidity and high heat. It gets hot in there for natural reasons. Hong Kong can get up to 30 degrees Celsius in the summer. Now, the tea isn't just stored in there forever, and it's not just going to stay in there for the duration of its life until it's sold. The teas were put on little wooden platforms so they wouldn't touch the ground, and likewise, they do not hug the walls, all to avoid excessive moisture accumulating. Also, the teas would get rotated every few months, which is actually a fairly big operation. What it does is to even out the aging process. So a gen of tea that was sitting in the darkest, wettest corner of the storage unit wouldn't stay there forever, but instead moved out to the front where it's drier and airier. Stuff that has been in the open before now gets the dark corner, etc. The same is true for how high this tea is placed. Stuff on top gets moved down, vice versa. It is, I think, important to emphasize that they want to avoid excessive moisture. This storage process differs by the tea and vendor, but generally speaking, from the different vendors I've talked to, a tea normally would not stay in a ground storage facility for more than two years. The tea gets moved to a regular dry storage facility where the removing the storage process begins. It would take much longer, six, eight, 10 years, or whatever the vendor deems sufficient. It is only then when the tea is ready. We can think of this storage method as related to or a sort of precursor to ripe tea, which is processed by exposing raw malcha to heavy heat and humidity for what is typically 45 days before airing them out and then maybe or maybe not pressing it. That part doesn't matter. Like that process, the traditional storage process is designed to ferment and mature the tea so it can change the character of the tea to be smoother, more mellow, and uh, in the opinion of uh, Cantonese Hong Kongers that drink this stuff, easier to drink. I think it's important to remember that this was the norm for poor storage for a huge amount of time. Uh, really up until the 1990s and even 2000s. If you're lucky enough to try HT from early 1990s or earlier, there's a really high likelihood that it has un undergone some form of traditional storage. This is probably a little confusing to some of you as it's t 2019, so it's later, but it's not that much later, and traditionally raw stored raw pour is definitely not the norm of what we are dealing with in the West when we purchase tea with age. So sometime in that time period, this shifted. What caused this shift? What we call dry storage and many of the more modern variations are more recent creations. So who is the inventor of dry storing raw pour intentionally? It's hard to say, but one proponent that became particularly well known because he did it at scale and made a lot of money off of it is Vesper Chan, the owner of Best Tea House. Uh, Best Tea House is a famous Hong Kong tea shop that's frequently associated with the tea referred to as the 1988 Ching Bing. This tea is several batches of Menghai Tea Factory 7542 from 1989 to 1992. Most importantly, these were dry stored in Hong Kong and are known for being um, a very early example of dry storage. Here's a description by Linda Louie, who runs Bana Tea, as is a student of Vesper Chan. The term dry storage was first introduced when Tea Master Chan stored a batch of 1988-7542 in his warehouse on the 10th floor of a high-rise building instead of in a basement. Aside from the usual humidity fluctuations of the Hong Kong weather, this batch of tea cakes was aged naturally, without any human manipulation. By the mid-2000s, this tea cake gained great popularity in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, and Tea Master Chan named it 88 Raw Cake. Baba Ching Bing. To commemorate the year he started in his tea business, 1988. Furthermore, eight is an auspicious number in the Chinese culture. 
Tea Master Chan and many 88 raw cake lovers attributed the beauty of the 88 raw cake to the natural dry storage aging this cake underwent, and its popularity has since created a new trend of puar storage. Now, I don't think it's necessarily 100% for sure that Vesper Chan invented dry storage. It's at least possible to cast uh, some skepticism on it. For instance, Sue in Malaysia, a tea friend of mine, has dry store tea from a decade, er decade earlier. But Mr. Chan certainly was early, stored a large-ish quantity, and made a lot of money and gained fame from it. It's also worth noting that the 1988 Qingbing was not an overnight success. It took quite a bit of time before there was an actual demand for it. In an interview with Poor.fr, he says in 2004, he sold some cakes for as low as 150 HKD, which is about 20 USD now, um, before the demand started to grow. Now that tea sells for over $10,000 per tea cake. One thing that dry storage has done is opened up the idea that you could home store. Storing teas on a hill in a humid basement and rotating them regularly would be an incredibly challenging and probably impossible endeavor on a small scale, even for a really dedicated hobbyist. It's also somewhat of a guarded secret. I've yet to hear of any uh, traditional storage setup not conducted by a vendor. But with an example of a tea like the 88 Ching Bing and other dry storage teas, the idea that a hobbyist could store tea in, a, in, in ways successfully um, started to really pick up and gain steam. What dry storage proponents believe is that traditionally stored pu'er is a crucial flaw. That the process of putting the tea in the ground storage fundamentally alters the way the tea tastes and smells. And some would also claim that it weakens the tea's chi and all the other stuff. On the other hand, something stored purely in a dry environment, meaning without ever going into that ground storage unit, would not have this problem. It retains the strength and the aroma of the original tea better. The downside is it takes a lot longer to age. The tea also keeps its astringency a lot longer, as well as the bitterness. Let's fast forward to today and look where we're at for storage in general now. The poor world in general has massively expanded, mainly towards the mainland Chinese market, but also to other places in Asia. Even in our tiny, tiny Western market, we now have access to tea stored from many different places and not just Hong Kong. We can find 10 to 15 year old tea stored in Kunming, Menghai, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Malaysia, and if we search hard enough, from the US. When reading tea descriptions, you're going to run into a few terms fairly frequently. Probably the most common form of nomenclature you'll see to describe teas in descriptions are dry storage, uh, gansang, or wet storage, shirkong. Uh, shirkong will be used for storage that is hotter or more humid. For better or worse, it is also often associated with certain areas such as uh, Guangdong in southern China, and it kind of has a somewhat negative connotation. Whereas uh, Gansang is drier storage and might be associated with other places such as Kunming. It's also important to remember that Shirkong and Gansang are relative terms with a whole range. For different tastes and different vendors, uh, Shirkong and Gansang can have somewhat different meanings depending on who's saying it. Someone based in Kunming may have a very different classification for what constitutes dry storage than what someone in Hong Kong might. Oftentimes, the storage location is paired with the storage type to give it a fuller description. For instance, you'll see Scott of Yunnan Sourcing, sometimes called teas, Guangdong Dry Storage, a helpful descriptor since we can infer that the tea is likely on the drier end of Guangdong storage. As an aside, I want to describe a bit about what the storage actually does. Speaking in generalities, as tea ages, the brew will naturally darken and the leaves should as well. How a tea was stored impacts this change. Drier storage will transform the tea less quickly. It will brew a lighter color than more humid storage, be a little sharper, stronger, and retain more of the tea's original character. Less dry storage will transform the tea more quickly. It will brew a darker color than the same tea stored dry than wood. The tea should be more mellow and brew up softer and smoother with less bitterness and astringency. It's important to note that this is a spectrum with a lot of teas that will blur the line. 
Most people end up gravitating towards some personal preference in storage, and for beginners out there, I do recommend trying a few samples from both categories before totally making up your mind. One of my own personal major annoyances is when Hong Kong storage is used synonymously with wet storage, as I see frequently. I think it's important not to conflate the two. How a tea is stored matters a lot. It's not just about location. And while Hong Kong is definitely a hot and humid place, let's not forget that the 1988 Qingbing, perhaps the most famous example of a dry stored tea, hails from the hot and humid Hong Kong and is a tea that tastes nothing like Hong Kong traditional storage. So what about traditional storage? Is this sort of tea still being sold now? Having been to Hong Kong a couple times in the past half decade, you still can certainly find it out there. For something that was once the norm, however, it has really grown out of style as current demand for this style of tea isn't as high um, as it once was. And the sort of tea uh, isn't in line with the current tastes of the poor market and younger generations of drinkers. This means even vendors that know the ins and outs of traditional storage and are still buying and selling teas aren't necessarily storing the bulk of their current tea uh, this way as they would have in the past. Storing tea in the West has been a source of discussion and disagreement pretty much since people in the English-speaking world started talking about it. When I first was reading about Poor in 2012, I remember reading old live journal and tea chat posts as well as blogs such as Bears 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 and Mike Petrel's old site called poodasher.net. These were the very early days and I think it's fair to say that people were doing their best to figure out uh, largely unknown things such as storage in the West. Before we dive into the real controversial topics, there are some things that are generally agreed upon for poor storage, mainly that it should be stored in a dark, odor-free environment. The main discourse in the West uh, deals with what normally gets described as a drier climate. Think back to traditionally stored and even drier stored poor. The norm of how it was stored um, for decades was, uh, was based off of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is very hot and humid. While there are some comparable places, such as Florida, most of the U.S. has a drastically different climate that just doesn't compare to Hong Kong or Taiwan. If you hang in tea circles, you'll notice that Kunming has a reputation as being a sort of poster child for very dry storage. I recently got a couple of cakes of really cheap Kunming stored raw tea from 2005. They're almost as green as your four-year-old cake from Malaysia. Kunming storage may have a decent rep in China, but some of us here in the U.S. aren't terribly fond of it. Giving it the moniker, Kunming cryostasis. Anyone who ever tried 1990s tea stored in Kunming, or 1990s tuo stored in Los Angeles Chinatown, would never be so misguided about the importance of humidity in aging. Low humidity, less than 60 to 65 percent, means no aged taste and leaves still mostly green after 15 years. I personally am of the opinion that cake stored in dry climates, like Kunming, or virtually anywhere in the U.S., will never turn into what we currently think of as aged poor. I've had 20-year-old tea that, other than subtle differences, I would not have been surprised if I had been told it was a 5-year-old tea. Now it's true that Kunming is inland, but it's also worth noting that Kunming in southwest China is also very much not a desert. The average Kunming stored tea does taste fundamentally different and greener than the same tea would be stored in an average Hong Kong dry storage setting. If we look at actual climate data and average it across a year, Kunming on average has around 72 or 73 relative humidity. This is a few points less than Hong Kong or Taipei, which have around 75 to 78 relative humidity on average, but isn't nearly as dry as you'd believe if you trust all the conventional wisdom on the internet. There's a couple points we're gonna come back to here in a bit, but this is all to illustrate that the norm for dry poor storage definitely isn't desert storage or anything like that. It's just that it's drier relatively. One other important aspect is temperature. Now the reason why I don't say that the West is full stop less humid is that this doesn't necessarily bear itself very obviously in the data, especially if we're looking at relative humidity. If we go back to Kunming versus Hong Kong or Taipei as an example, the relative humidities are actually kind of close, but there's a much more substantial temperature difference. Kunming on average is 58 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit over the course of the year. Whereas places like Hong Kong, Taipei, Kuala Lumpur, and even Jinghong, also in Yunnan, are much hotter. 
All of these above places average at least 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than Kunming. So in some sense, it is more of a temperature difference rather than strictly a humidity one. And if it's not heated, Kunming storage may be more of an example of cooler and a little less humid storage rather than strictly drier storage. Moving to the US, quite a few locations end up looking kind of like Kunming and with the exception of some Florida locations, not too many look like Hong Kong or Taipei. It's not enough to look at your climate data and say, hey, look, it's an average of 75 relative humidity where I live in San Francisco. Um, poor is going to age uh, fantastic and quickly. Being both hot and humid is important. So how hot and humid are we talking? I have friends that live in New York and Washington DC and they complain to me about how hot and humid the summers are compared to Seattle. Sure enough, this does bear itself out in our climate data for at least part of the East Coast. But even during the hottest and most humid quarter of the year, it still falls short of the 70-70 temperature relative humidity line that marks many of the places that are known to have uh, less dry storage uh, in East Asia. Now it does get relatively close, but it shows that even during the hottest and most humid times of the year in certain places of our country, it still doesn't match the average heat and humidity that you're gonna get in various parts of Southern China and, uh, and Southeast Asia. That brings us to another exceedingly important topic for any Westerner looking to HT, inside storage. You may say, okay, so this is a temperature issue. No problem, I'm storing my teas indoors at room temperature, so that solves that. My tea will always be at 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside conditions, however, are a whole nother beast. So I live in Seattle, Washington in the US, and I'm going to use this as a sort of stand-in uh, as an example. Seattle is a city known for and nicknamed Rain City after its climate. Sounds humid. And indeed, true to form, the average humidity for the year in Seattle ends up being somewhat high, around 71 to 72 relative humidity, right around Kunming levels. But the temperature is 51 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so I should store the tea inside, right? As it turns out, I've been measuring my ambient living conditions in a few apartments for the past four or five years since I've gotten into poor. The temperature is expectedly around 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, depending on the time of the year, but the relative humidity is way down, uh, much less than you would think from looking at the outside climate data. It probably ranges between 30 to, to 45 relative humidity, and occasionally it'll spike up, but I'd say on average it comes out to around 40 relative humidity over the course of the year. Some may be able to end up with a more natural solution, say cardboard boxes, if they can get high enough temperature and humidity. But I'd say a strong majority of the US and probably Europe struggle with either heat or humidity. If I were to store my tea outside, say in a garage, at best I'd have tea on par with Kunming, but another seven or eight degrees colder. Inside, I'd run the risk of drying tea out. And for the few teas I have stored on myself for a few years, I've not been very happy with the results. And this is how people end up settling on solutions that a lot of people in East Asia probably think are a little wacky. Pumadors, sealed storage, crock storage, etc. I'm not going to dive too far into each of these and talk about things that are really specific like individual parameters, but I'll quickly glaze over a few of them. Pumadors are essentially closed systems that are designed for you to basically manipulate humidity and possibly temperature. It could be a simple food grade plastic bin, a wine cooler, a mini fridge, etc. Individual setups vary significantly and depending on the ambient climate hand you've been dealt, it may vary in difficulty in getting to the parameters you want. But the idea is to get conditions that satisfy both a high enough temperature and a high enough humidity. Popular ways to add humidity are Bovida packs, which are essentially two-way humidity packs, homemade salt packs, humidity beads, etc. Another storage type people in the West have taken to is sealed storage, 
Like humidors, there's a ton of variation here, but it essentially involves sealing tea, usually in plaster wrap or mylage. There's various schools of thoughts here. Some like to contain the aroma and focus of the tea. Others may just find it simpler to set up and it works better for them in their situation. Sometimes, like humidors, there will be added humidity, and in the case of Marco's heated hot box storage, added temperature. A final solution I'll mention here is crock storage, uh, something Seawin, another blogger, is known for. In some ways, it, it ends up being quite similar to the other storage, a semi-closed system where you can add humidity, the additional benefit of a little bit more breathability. How well will these storage setups be in the long run? It's frankly really hard to say. I've had a few examples of poor from the early pioneers um, and just about everything is on the dry storage spectrum that I've tried. These three methods are all still in the very early years, so we will really have to wait and see. Okay, so thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Really appreciate any feedback uh, and I will